Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Subtext Podcast Archives. These are the long lost episodes of the Subtext that were originally produced between 2015 and 2017. In 2018, the Subtext moved to American Theatre Magazine, and we've been producing the pod there monthly ever since. These time capsules are being shared here in their entirety including plenty of outdated references and advertisements for events far in the past. If you enjoy them, please subscribe to the current podcast feed for the subtext or stream new episodes on the website for American Theatre Magazine. Thank you for listening. I have a strong vigilante streak in me. I don't know where it comes from, but it's deep. It all started in college when, for the first time, I found a little confidence in myself. I became one of those people, and I'm sure many of you have these people in your life, one of those people who you know will talk back to the guy being a jerk at a bar or on public transportation or in a coffee shop. I couldn't allow myself or any person around me to be pushed around. Bullies are my trigger, and I can't help myself. At least, I should say, I used to not be able to help myself. I spent the first 30-something years of my life on the East Coast, and it felt safe there, I felt like I understood boundaries there. When I moved to LA, that all changed. This is a strange city to me in the sense that, despite the fact that I've lived here for nine years, I've never felt settled, never comfortable. I don't understand the boundaries here. I fear everybody has a gun. So I had to pull back on my sense of vigilantism. I couldn't risk being killed. I couldn't risk escalating a situation. I could not control and possibly get others harmed. So I started to put my head down, buy my coffee, and finally exit. Now, during the years I've been living in L.A., social media has become an important component of my day-to-day life. I've used it, like many others do, to keep in touch with friends and family, as well as following the various happenings in the American theater world. And through all this interaction on websites and social media, I have noticed something insidious, and that is the rise of the intellectual bully. The intellectual bully is the bully who uses their intelligence to craft an argument to back up their bullying. And if you step up to them, you better bring your own intellectual rigor. If you don't, you'll be destroyed by a tightly written logical diatribe explaining why gender inequality is a myth, or how creating opportunities for people of color is racist towards white people. They make a strong case, and it's all bullshit, but you can't call it that. No, because you're an idiot. The intellectual bully thrives on their sense of superiority. I would guess even this short comment I'm making right now could be completely dismantled by one of these people. And who are these people? I have no problem painting a picture with a broad brush because these people are always white and they're always men. But you can't say always, Brian. That's not fair. There must be examples of non-white people, non-male people, non-white male people making morally superior arguments about how there is no more racism since Obama got elected or how the genders became equal the moment women got the right to vote. If you find yourself saying that or thinking that, you are a morally superior intellectual bully and you are a white man. They make their arguments against the Kilroys, against the Jubilee, against the Latino Commons, against calling out abuse at Profiles Theater in Chicago. Now, here's my problem. I'm not particularly intellectual myself. I am a genius of my emotions, but a little thin upstairs when it comes to crafting an argument to combat this form of bullying. And that scares me, because now more than ever, All forms of bullies need to be conquered. They need to be shut down. They need to be shut up. And I don't have a solution. There certainly is no actual solution. But what I'm vowing to do is not run away from bullies anymore. I will be standing up again, particularly in my theater community, where I find it as bizarre as I do insidious. We are artists. There should be no fighting amongst the creators. But I'm ready to do it if it needs to be done. And I ask anybody out there listening to do the same. The world is changing in some pretty scary ways. It's time to stand up. Welcome 
Welcome to the subtext where playwrights talk to playwrights about the joy and sadness and sadness and joy of playwriting. My name is Brian James Polak. I write plays and take lots of Instagram photos of my dog. Thank you to everybody who in the past left comments about the subtext on iTunes. Our page has been barren, a barren wasteland for a couple months, so I encourage you to hit it up now and say your piece about how wonderful and amazing the subtext is. You can speak to us directly on the Twitters at Subtext Podcast. And if you have something private to say, you can email us at thesubtextpodcast at gmail.com. We received a couple e- nice emails after the Mary Laws episode, and I'm so glad these interviews are bringing light to some of you. We need that. More of that. This month's guest is D.G. Watson, author of the play Unbound, produced by I Am a Theater Company at Hudson Backstage Theater in Los Angeles. Let's talk to DG, who I think goes by Daryl. You opened what, like a we week ago, two, two we weeks o- ago? We opened on October 29th, mm-hmm. so that was about two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because when I got the email from Steph about you yeah. and us trying to connect before I left, before the election, Yeah. I feel like if, if we had done that, before the election, it would have been a very different conversation than yeah. what I, th- where I'm at now. To- with it. Even the play itself feels, it feels so different. Well, what's yeah. actually interesting to be to be talking to you about uh, about your play, I this is I think this is one of the first times I've I'm talking to a playwright uh, who has a play that's going on while we're talking and. I have tickets for it. Uh-huh. I haven't seen it yet. Uh-huh. Usually I see the play before I talk to the person. Sure. Uh, and it just didn't work out this time. Uh-huh. Uh, and I absolutely have zero knowledge of what your play is. <laughs> I know that, uh, I know who, I know the director, uh-huh. Jennifer Chambers. I think she's amazing. Yes. She's one of my favorites. And uh, Gates McFadden is in it. Yes. And Gates is kind of a legend. Yes. Uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. Right, yeah. And she ran Ensemble Studio Theater here in L.A. for Correct. such a long time. Um, and she's just an amazing theater supporter. But anyway, like, I mean, I know some, I know where it's being done, you know, but I know nothing right. about your play. And uh, and it's actually kind of curi- curious for me to talk to somebody who we met for the first time on the sidewalk outside five, <laughs> five minutes ago. I don't know your work. And now we're about to talk for an hour. We're going to talk for an about hour about myself, right? And you too. I'm because I, 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 at least I remember in the in the interview you did with uh, Mary. Yeah, Mary. Lawrence. You were talking about you talked about yourself too. I yeah, mean, I mean, that's how much of, of yourself do you allow slash like to have in these interviews? Because that's kind of interesting. I mean, we find out more about. It seems like we find out a little bit about you as much as we find out about the people that you're interviewing. Yeah. So some of this is is my own like i can't get out of my own way when it comes to that so i end up talking about myself a lot right. like i can't i can't help it it you know it's 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 um it's two things it's right. it's ego obviously but it's also the and i think i may have said this on an episode a couple months ago um we've been doing this for almost 2 years now mm-hmm. and um i had never done these sort of interviews these podcasts before mm-hmm. um and i'm a playwright and i am trying to find my way in the world mm-hmm. and i'm starting to realize that this and a friend of mine actually planted this idea in my head he listens to to this podcast he's an actor and um it's sort of like this this podcast is essentially like my journey for figuring out how the playwriting world works going through all of these different people who have all had each an individual journey to get to where they are in the moment we're sitting down and talking so there's that's kind of like the overarching narrative for uh the long term of this of this podcast which could go indefinitely you know because it's uh seeking of oneself is an unending journey i i i believe um, so, so that these, this is why I end up talking about myself. <laughs> and then I get, I get like some people I'm interviewing, like yourself, you just asked me about me and I'll did. go on for five minutes and I'm like, it's kind of a trap, you know? <laughs> um, so I have to like, uh, I have to like stop myself and be like, we're actually here. We're actually here to talk to you. Right. Right. 
Uh, and it's like a deflection. It's like a deflection of yours to like turn it on me. <laughs> it's like see how much time we can burn of this hour talking about the uh, the other guy. All right, well played, Brian. Well, so, well, well, pl- well played. I have some. Bas- I have. I have a couple <laughs> basics just to get rolling because uh, your your author name is D. G. Watson, right? Uh, but people call you Daryl, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. My author name. I include my middle name, so okay. I have a. And I have some friends who use initials as as well, but I wasn't sure if I should refer to you as DG or Daryl. You can call me Daryl's fine. Okay, Daryl's fine. So Daryl, Daryl. Um, I don't know a lot of I don't know a lot of playwrights who are based in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about that. Uh, well, I've only been based in Las Vegas recently. I grew up in Las Vegas. Uh, so it's not like I just decided, you know what, Vegas is the town for me. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be there. Um, my dad was in the military, and so he was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. And so my family moved out there in the early '80s when I was like three, three years old. Mm-hmm. So I grew up there, and then I moved to New York, where I went to school, and lived in New York for almost ten years. And was by the tail end of that, I was working in entertainment, and then I decided to leave the industry and go soul searching, soul seeking. And uh, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. I imagine we'll probably go back to some of this, but just to yeah, just we'll to answer that. your basic question, um, I've, I'm now fi- I now find myself back in Vegas, and I'm with my folks now, and I'm I'm helping my mother take care of my grandmother, and. Uh, Coming out here to work on whatever whatever I can, whether it's a play or stuff that I want to try to develop for television, mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah, that's the short answer. That's how I come to be in Las Vegas right now. But it's also a place that I I seem to keep sort of falling back into, and I feel like as an adult, I feel like my experience of Las Vegas as a child obviously this is so much different now my my experiencing it as an adult because i think my my mom did a really good job of keeping my brother and i away from that culture like i remember us going cuz they they have slot machines like like the cd gambling porny sort of stripper <laughs> culture well i don't definitely not so much it was really the gambling that my mom i think my parents were concerned about the the porn and the and the that the 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 drugs and all that stuff that I think was, they weren't really worried about that in the moment. Like as I'm like little ki- little right, little right. kid, Daryl. You right. know what I mean? But it was really because the gambling, you got to go to really find the really dirty, shitty part of Vegas. You got to go looking for it. Uh-huh. But the gambling, the gambling is in Seven Elevens. It's in supermarkets. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's in, in pharmacies. It's intense. You can get yeah. It's it's crazy. And so as a kid, who's used to seeing arcade games. Mm. And like lights and the noises that they make, I'd I'd want my mom to. I was like, "Hey, play the, play the, right. play the slot machines," and she was like, "No, no, 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 no. That's not how, that's not how that works." And uh, there's actually a this there's there's a story um, that I'll, I'll, I'll a memory that I'll never forget, and it was my family. I think we were eating at a buffet at the Luxor, and. Uh, I was walking through the casino floor with my uncle and my cousin, and my cousin and I were trying to get my uncle to play the slots, and we were just on him and on him and on him about it. And finally, he pulled out a quarter, and he holds it up, and he's like, you see this? I worked for this quarter. I put my blood, (laughs) sweat, and tears into this quarter, and now I'm going to put it into this machine, and it's going to be gone. You don't make money in casinos. Yeah. That's not how casinos work. Right. Casinos are profitable because you lose. Right. And so he put the quarter in the slot machine and won $5. <laughs> I totally forgot. I think, I'm, I don't know if it was exactly $5. It was something, it was something, it was around right. that. But he, he won. He won. And the yeah. look on his face was, it was, it was <laughs> priceless, man. We're like, oh my God. We're like, well, we, we got, we got to gamble now. Right, now we right. got to do it. Now we got to, now we got to dive in. Oh, so God. that, so that mess, that, that sort of messed me up a little bit. But so did you get, did you get hooked? Did you get into gambling ever? No, no. Um, but it's interesting. Recently, I've really, I've started to think more about it 
and I, I picked up a bunch of poker books mm-hmm. uh, over the summer and started reading about reading them. I really, for some reason, there's, at some point, I want to kind of have like a, a weekly or a monthly poker night mm-hmm. with my friends. Like, I feel like. It would just be a fun thing to do, like, I don't know, male bonding shit, whatever. Yeah. But also, there's something about playing poker that, that because I think a lot of it revolves around not just, obviously not just luck, but strategy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I kind of like that. And I've played, I've played poker a few times, and I, I like, I like being, I like being at a table around, around with people and competing against them in this way that is friendly but also competitive yeah and and kind of kind of feeling where everyone's at and like tr- like calculating my next move and and like those moments when I do win a hand and like how good that f- I mean you can see I can see how it gets addictive yeah, for sure yeah for sure when I was on the bus uh from Las Vegas to LA the guy sitting behind me had lost all of his money he was he wasn't talking to me, but he was bemoaning to the guy next to him that he Oh god, this seems like, a classic. It it, it I, w- I should have talked to him. I should have just asked him if I could if I could interview him and just hear about yeah. his weekend cuz he he lost everything and he was just like, "Yeah, man, I realize it now like you can't go to Vegas unless you have money, unless you have money to burn, but if it's money that you need, you can't do it, man. Yeah. You can't do it." See, I so. never got I never got hooked on the gambling because I never I mean, growing. I grew up in New Hampshire, and mm-hmm. there's like we're really far from casinos, and mm-hmm. now there are a ton of them in like Connecticut. But when I was a kid, those Connecticut casinos didn't exist, uh, so like the concept of gambling was just so far as Las Vegas, and it was Atlantic City. But mm-hmm. then I went to college in in Northern Virginia, Washington D.C., and Atlantic mm-hmm. City suddenly became accessible, mm-hmm. and I had a bunch of friends who were into playing cards and going to casinos and whatnot. And so my first taste. Of going to the casinos, I just lost all my money. It was like <laughs> oh, loss after loss after, and I was eighteen, nineteen yeah. years old. I didn't have any money, so losing forty bucks was like shit. Yeah, I've got literally zero dollars now. Good thing I have uh, an account at the dining hall at school, so I can <laughs> still eat. But like nothing ever connected with me. It made it sort of like a positive experience. Good. Um, and it was Atlantic City, which yeah. I don't know if you've ever been there. No, it is. It is. Uh, it's not sexy, you know. It's not. It's not Las Vegas. It's sort of like, you know, the seedy underbelly of Las Vegas uh, is Atlantic City, basically. Right. <laughs> like that's right. what you, that's what you get. Uh, so anyway, um, but I can see the appeal. And when you were talking about before about how these uh, in Las Vegas these slot machines are all over the place. Yeah, slot machines and electronic poker um, translate very easily to arcade games, like yes. like you said, into a child. The idea of playing, like, I would imagine these games would um, lessen the interest in arcades because the electric poker, electronic poker, and slot machines spit out, have the potential to spit out money. Yeah. Where Pac Man doesn't spit anything out. You know, right. the best thing you could, that could happen on Pac Man is to get you, you get your high score on a list. The best thing that could happen on a slot machine is. Money pours out of it, you know. Yeah. So I can I can really understand the sort of psychological hook for a young person. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like even just thinking about that, like the the fun of an arcade game is just the experience of. I mean, yeah, you get a high score on Pac Man, but the fun of it is being Pac Man and evading all the ghosts yeah. and trying to eat the little pelt. So like, there's a story yeah, within true, yeah. in an arcade game, but with a with a. A video. There's, no story, yeah. There's no story. It's just the story is you trying to get money out of it yeah. by playing this system that's totally rigged against you. Yeah. Oh you yeah. 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 And I think understanding understanding um, that it is absolutely rigged against the player mm-hmm. helps helped me from becoming into it. You know. Yeah. Because there have, over my over my years since going to Atlantic City as an undergrad, I've gone to casinos like in Vegas and I've gone to casinos in like the Bahamas and places like that. And I've mm. won some money. Not mm. a lot, because I don't gamble a lot, but I have won like a hundred bucks. And you what get, games were what games are you playing? Like roulette. Yeah. That's a fun that's a, it's, that's a fun but, game. Like roulette is the stupidest game <laughs> in the world because there's absolutely zero skill. But you, once you hit one, mm. you feel like you figured something out. Yeah. And um, it's so dumb. But I hit a number, 
and I thought I I like had the secret to life, you know? Yeah. Um, and and like you have you have that moment where you're just like, oh, okay, yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. And then you, like you have to snap out of it. You have to be like, wait, this is just so stupid. It's random. It's a ball going around in a circle. It could land on any number. There's right. nothing guiding it. And there's nothing that's sort of like you feel like you know the odds. It hasn't hit black twenty two in like eighteen turns. It's gonna hit that number. I just know it is, but it has no like. There's no reason why it's gonna hit that number, um, and it's not supposed to. But that's why the casino wins. Exactly. Anyway, um, uh, I like that we get to talk about. Like, I never talked about gambling with anybody on this podcast before, so it's kind of <laughs> cool. You're the first. You're the first Vegas playwright. So um, great. I'm glad I. Init- I'm glad to help initiate the yeah. subtext into yeah the. Uh, world of gambling. So when you so you you were in Vegas until you went away to undergrad. Mm-hmm. So yeah. was it was your uh, relationship to the city different when you became like a teenager and you started to become more independent? Well, that's a really that's a really interesting question because I actually became really religious uh, when I turned sixteen, mm-hmm. or seventeen. Mm-hmm. Um, so from like seventeen to twenty one. I was I was pretty devout, mm-hmm. I was a devout Christian, and uh, I went to school for acting and kind of had always told myself if, you know, for some reason I decide not to continue this path, like I might go into the ministry mm-hmm. or go to seminary. So my relationship to Vegas, I think as I became a teenager, like a lot of worse, like maybe some of my friends would were kind of becoming more independent and sort of delving into mm-hmm. the world of Vegas adulthood, I was kind of withdrawing more away from that mm-hmm. and sort of going to church and singing in the church band and, like, reading my Bible and participating in youth group. And uh, and so that... So, yeah, so that was that's kind of where I... That was sort of the spirit of where I was when I left New York. And then when I got to New York, that really... That really blew my mind, blew my mind way open. Yeah, it was it was like a culture shock, like nothing I'd I'd ever experienced. Well, stepping back a little bit, okay. were were you not particularly religious until you were a teenager? Well, my family we went to church when I was a kid. Um, we were United Methodist, and so we we were we would go like occasionally, like mm-hmm. pretty regularly. Um, and then uh, my parents got divorced, and I feel like we kind of stopped. Uh, my mom had uh, had a, what do you call it, primary custody. Mm-hmm. And so we sort of stopped going as much. And then at a certain point, and then my brother left for college, and then it was just my mom and I living together. And then we had pretty much stopped going, I think, at all, like, across the board. Yeah. I think we might have gone maybe for Easter or Christmas, but I, I really don't remember but for some but at one point i think it was it was christmas i just got it in my head t- to read the new testament because i'd never i realized i'd never actually read the bible mm-hmm. i'd never read the story of jesus mm-hmm. and so i just sat down and did it i read the, four, the i read it from beginning to end the new testament and that converted me mm. or reconverted me I fell in but, love but with it. by yourself. I just, yeah, I read it by Sitting myself. Sitting in your room, you weren't like listening to some charismatic preacher. No. You were your charismatic preacher. The <laughs> the book was the book was your charismatic preacher. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, the got the wow. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. John. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that so I when I finished that, I I sort of decided to kind of recommit myself and then and then, so my mom, so I started wanting to go more, and then my mom um, started wanting to go more, too. And then we both got really kind of involved with it. Mm. And it's interesting, because I've, I've, since then, I've sort of stepped away from it. Like, I went through a period where I actually lost my faith. I was in, I was 21, and I was studying abroad in London, and I had this uh, crisis of, of faith. And I think it was just being in a, being in New York... Being in theater school and meeting so many people from so many different backgrounds, sexual orientations, religions, uh, and I couldn't, there were a lot of sort of um, principles within Christianity that I was having a hard time, or at least the way that I was interpreting it, 
that I was having a hard time reconciling with the fact that there were people that I, who weren't Christian, who didn't believe what I believed, but who I still cared about Mm -hmm. and loved and didn't, felt really uncomfortable with the idea of them burning in hell because they didn't believe what I believed. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really see how I could enjoy paradise if I knew that the people that I cared about and loved were being tormented for eternity. I didn't see how God could even yeah. be at peace in, in heaven knowing that. And so uh, I, was, I, was, I remember I was studying abroad in London. Uh, I was 20, 20 or 21, I can't remember. And uh, I, I kind of hit this wall, and I started praying, and I said, okay. I was like, I need a, I need a burning bush. Mm. That's what I need. Mm-hmm. It's gonna. It's gonna. I know that that's that's arrogant of me to ask, but I need that right now. Mm-hmm. I need some irrefutable proof that you are there because there's too many people that I care about, and I can't just in my mind resign, resign them to that fate. I need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're real. That this is all real, and if I don't get that, I'm gonna have to take that as a sign mm-hmm. that this is not the end of the truth. This is not where the truth ends. And I waited about 20 minutes, which seemed like a reasonable amount of time for the, <laughs> right. for the creator of the universe right. to right. give me a burning something. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't happen. So that weekend, I got drunk for the first time hmm. in my life. I got totally shit-faced. And... Were you yeah. were you in this headspace of, like, there's no point to the world? Like, everything, nothing matters, so I might as well get hammered? Uh... I think, so I didn't hear anything, and then I was like, okay, okay, that's it then. And I think some part of me actually felt relief. Hmm. It felt, and this is actually, I don't, I've never really thought about this much before, just reflecting on the moments right after. I've always thought about, like, the years after, Mm -hmm. but not, like, the moments after. I think I felt relief. I mean, I think my religion gave did give me a lot of moral guidance and ethical guidance, but I think I also used it as a barrier to prevent me from engaging with people yeah. and having experiences that might have been uncomfortable for me yeah. and might have pushed, you know, per, you know, my personal boundaries. So, yeah, I went to a bar with my friends and I was like, okay, I'm dr- everyone's drinking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a drink. Drink too. And were your friends aware of of what you were going through in the moment? Oh yeah, yeah. I was real. They all, (laughs) they all knew. I, I don't, I don't know if I would go so far to say that I evangelized to my friends. Yeah. I don't think I was ever like heavy on them about trying to convert them, but I was. I don't, I don't, I didn't, I didn't hide. I'd like to ask them. Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you can you can invite them to the to the podcast. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so so you had this break. I had this break, yeah. And uh, where did that take you, other than to the bar that night? It took me to the bar. It took me. It did take me through sort of an existential crisis of not a feeling adrift, uh, and not really knowing if there was a meaning to life, mm. and feeling frightened. And uh, but I feel like my work. I think my my I feel like my work as an artist benefited I think to some de- to some degree cuz I think that I was able to let go more I was able to really kind of let let go and and access you mean like inhibitions like, yeah like I being think embarrassed about things yeah and I think that I think it's still an ongoing that's an ongoing sort of process but I think delving into the, like the more darker aspects of myself mm-hmm. and not and not being afraid. And actually, I did a I did a production of uh, we did Romeo and Juliet, and I played I got to play Mercutio, and that was I remember that that role still sort of sticks with me because I remember that was a role where I really kind of felt like I could be whoever because he's and he's sort of crazy, mm-hmm. and I could kind of be who I really kind of wanted to be without with I had the freedom to do that, and that's what's kind of great about art is that you as at least being an actor is that yeah. you can. You can explore those parts of yourself. The trick is getting back to your, you know, your actual self, you know, right. when that's when that's all over. So the armchair psychologist in me <laughs> uh, is thinking about how you came to this um, strong religious faith mm-hmm. at a time that is, in general, 
I can't believe I'm talking like this. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like doing this, but I can't help myself. All right, it's going, it's, it's going, it's, go, it's, it's going, go. It's like, it's like, uh, when you're grow in general, when you're growing up, like this period where you came into, you refound faith. You mm-hmm. you picked up the Bible, you picked up the New Testament, and you read it. Mm-hmm. That's the time when, um, life is hardest. Like. That yeah. you're you're you are transcending from childhood into adulthood. You, the general you, is transcending yeah. from childhood into adulthood in this period. And I feel like what I'm hearing is you 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 found this faith, and it actually could have, in a lot of ways, particularly in the context of living in Las Vegas, like a mm. dark and scary and weird place, it kind of bridged that. Mm. You got to you got like it created a bridge for you, and you got to journey through this hard. What can what can be a very hard period, and perhaps it still was regardless of uh, your religious experiences. But it sounds like it got you into that first bit, and then here you are into this next section of uh, adulthood because you're finishing. You know, you're in college, and you're you're twenty, twenty one years old, and mm-hmm. you've got what a year of college left, and yeah. it, the real world is now you're being confronted with the real world. So it kind of makes it kind of makes sense to me how these things happen when they happen to you. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't, I don't think I've really thought about it that way before. Um, the funny thing is, is, like, I keep going back to it. Like, I keep, there are periods in my life where I keep sort of returning to uh, scripture and, and sort of religious writings in general. Like, I, I study Buddhism now and, and Taoism and, and everything that I can kind of get my hands on and, and try to see how it all connects. Um, I really, uh, Joseph Campbell, uh, his stuff yeah. I really like. And, uh, and now, recently, with all the stuff that's going on in, with the election, like, I, I have this little copy of, I can't believe I'm saying this, I have this little copy of the New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs in it. And I've just been feeling so afraid of what's happening that I've, I'm, I'm carrying it around in my pocket now. Yeah. And I used to do that when I was in college all the time, and I stopped doing it. And this is the first time I've done that in since I was like over 15 years. I get and so it. to do that, so now, it's weird to be talking about this now and be thinking that I'm sort of returning. It is sort of this sort of safe rock, you know, that I can kind of yeah. plant my feet on during these sort of turbulent times. But we're entering, I mean, we're entering what could potentially be another, like... Not like I talked about uh, adolescence as like a dark, challenging, hard yeah. period in the in like life growing up, but uh, what we could be entering is a dark, challenging period for life in general, for people in general, you know, <laughs> right. regardless yeah. regardless of age. So yeah. how do we how do we build a bridge to get through it, you know, or do we build a bridge to get over, or do we? Do we, uh, you know, actively get into it? No, don't go over it. Don't go around it. Go into it and fight through it. I mean, is it like kind of going down into a well where you like you have to go down into it, but you need like a rope tied around you? Yeah. And, so I that mean, you can come back. You got to be able to come back out. And that's what this is what I'm afraid of, because uh, to to speak directly and not through metaphor, uh, <laughs> once you said the well, that kind of like locked me into what. I'm afraid of. Mm. I'm in. Uh, I'm in avoidance mode right now. Mm-hmm. So sometime around eleven o'clock Tuesday night, election night, mm. I had to stop because reality was too much for me. I mm. couldn't acknowledge it. I couldn't. I couldn't keep watching until it was real. Um, because maybe I can keep it from being real. Um, and I turned it off. And on Wednesday. I'm not kidding you. I work. I went to work. Didn't talk to anybody. Closed my office door at work. And I work. I work at a theater. Mm-hmm. My full time job's at a theater, mm-hmm. so it's very communal, and we're always talking to each other. Um, and I never have my door closed ever because there's no air conditioning in my office, so mm-hmm. it just gets hot. Um, I closed the door, tried to get work done, but I just watched animal videos <laughs> all day long because yeah. c- social media it's all there oh, yeah. um the new it's it's on every single website and i am a like i have like 10 websites that i cycle through constantly and it's mm-hmm. all news and politics and some sports and 
I was even afraid of sports mm. because I was afraid that sports news would be in relation to the election. Um, and I couldn't, and I couldn't do it. And I was just numb. And I literally kept going to YouTube and watching 10 minute long, <laughs> funny animal videos, like horses <laughs> taking off somebody's hat and eating it, you know, or a, a dog peeing on a baby. Like, it was just like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a dog peeing on a baby. And yeah. The it's sort of somebody like put their baby down and the dog, like they have a puppy and the puppy is like, Oh, look at the puppy and the baby. And all of a sudden the puppy pees on the baby. And it's like that that got me through like that first day of anxiety. But here we are. It's now it's now the Sunday following that Tuesday. And I'm still um, I'm still incapable of jumping back into the news and uh, wondering if I should jump back into sports the way I used to. Mm -hmm. I used to be a humongous sports fan and I would watch sports religiously, read all sports news, watch game after game after game. And then which sport? Uh, football, basketball, baseball. Cool. I'm, I'm I'm a Boston fan for all of all three, and um, so growing up, you know, like I had a good basketball team as a kid, but yeah. then my my baseball team, my football team, always lost right. until the 2000s, and uh, they started to win. So I felt that euphoria as an adult of winning, mm-hmm. and um, and as I was getting older, I realized I put sports into perspective. Uh, oh, they don't really matter that much. It's escapism. It's not that important. I felt them winning, so I started to drift away from it. Mm-hmm. And this election is making me think I might need that escapism yeah. again to get through this 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 potentially very dark period. So I'm thinking I'm going to start back up with the fantasy baseball, which is such a wonderful time suck. But on the other hand, I've got these friends, and maybe you have friends like this as well. Maybe this is you. <laughs> um, I have friends who are very, very, very engaged right now, and they mm. are ready to fight. Mm. And I'm so inspired by them. I'm afraid of what it's going to do to me and bring me down into a well, mm-hmm. and, like a pit of despair. I'm, af- I'm afraid of that being the result of me, mm. like, Turning into uh, turning away, not turning into sports, but turning into the into the fight, not going over it, like I said, not going around it, but going into it. Yeah, I'm really afraid of what that happens to me psychologically and emotionally. Yeah, sorry, no, 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 <laughs> man, I I feel you, I feel you. Uh, Wednesday, Tuesday, I had the pretty much the same response. Like Tuesday, I was checking. This uh, I forget. I think it was called Vote Tracker. This new uh, program that yeah. they said was going to be able to tell us yeah. real time, and that <laughs> that was a total. But was this the Slate dot com? I think yeah. Yeah. They. I mean, they called it disaster. In the yeah. Yeah. And then watching the New York Times. Uh, um, yeah. That whole that percentage thing. The needle moved from eighty five percent Clinton to. Nine, and I kept hitting the yeah. refresh button over and over and over again. I was like, something is wrong. Like this can't be happening. And then I went to bed, and it was so hard, man, because my, my grandmother is 90 years old, and she's been watching, following this whole thing, and she was like, well, who's, who's winning? And we were like, we don't know. We'll tell you. She's like, well, and we have to, but we have to go to bed. We're, like, tired. We got to yeah. go to bed. So she was like, will you tell me tomorrow morning who wins? <laughs> And we're like, yeah. And I did not want to be the one to have to oh, tell her. Man. And you were living in Nevada, yeah. which is like this <laughs> swing state, which was like so much, so much. Like, like I'm in California, right? Right, where we all know where everything's going to go. There, the the uh, the candidates don't come here, right? Unless they're trying to raise some money, right? But they don't they don't campaign here, but. You know, just a couple hours away in Nevada, they spent so much time there. It must have been kind of intense. It was. I mean, it's weird because that, um, what was I going to say? That, I don't know if you heard about the Trump campaign suing yeah. Clark County. Yeah. The grocery store that was at the center of that was the one that we voted at. Oh. I'm pretty sure it was. It was, a. Uh, it was, um, yeah, it was this, it was this, this grocery store. And, um, and they sued because they kept open longer than they were well they yeah they to. let they let if you if you got in line before the, the polls closed before closed they would let you yeah. they let you vote and so um so yeah so that so that really kind of hit home um but 
I was actually kind of proud of Nevada because we did, we, 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 it didn't go, it didn't go for Trump. Elected and, the first Latina senator in it, history, it, which is amazing. Yes. It's 2016. This is the first time we've had a Latina senator. And, uh, and it legalized recreational marijuana. <laughs> yeah. So, which we're all, we're all going to need <laughs> now. So, so that happened. But yeah, so on Wednesday, um, I I I, sh- I completely shut down. I didn't look at social media. I didn't um, I didn't look at any news. I just was writing, just working on on work stuff, and was listening to music like all mm-hmm. all day. And my we we sat down for dinner and we we watched a little bit of news just to like I check. I mean, I checked once just to get the final result, but. I have. I've never done that. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. I can't even watch Saturday Night Live. Oh yeah. Well, last night, which was... I heard was really cathartic, but I can't. I'm not ready to laugh. That's my struggle. Is I'm not ready to laugh about it yet. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I feel like I. So I, I've. I didn't. I entered into a period where I was. I shut down, and then I got angry, and then, I was like, okay. I mean, this is this is what's happening, and like my parents, my grandparents have been through this before. They've been through a lot worse than mm. I have, so yeah. they made it through. So, God, I can right. I can make it. Th- I I have to be able to make it through this too. And so I was just thinking about the fact that, you know, um, there's been this call to kind of you know make America great again and return to the time of the 1950s, but mm-hmm. and people just you know. Amazed that history is repeating itself, and then I had this. I, I had this sort of. For me, it was a breakthrough. Realizing, well, if history repeats itself, and we're trying to return to the fifties, what came after the nineteen fifties? It was the nineteen sixties. The nineteen sixties were a very powerful moment. Yeah, it was a powerful moment. Uh, era of change, and so I don't think it's going to just be. Who knows if he's even going to follow through on any of the things that he says that he's going to do. The, the frightening thing is that we just don't know. We don't know what he's going to do. Yeah, you can't in, brace yourself. Once he's in there. You but, can't brace yourself. If it's Mitt Romney, because, who is yeah. now president, you know that he's fiscal, fiscally conservative. Taxes are going to go down. We're going to tighten the belt. Like, it's that, like you kind of, it's sort of, like you just understand what's going to happen next. And that's what's so, you're right. It, we just don't know. And that not knowing is so... It's so scary. It is. But I think that people are not... I mean, there's going to... There's there's resistance right now to it, so... I know. It's kind of beautiful. And that... And actually, when I... So when I went and saw... I saw I saw the play, my play again, this... this um, Yesterday, last night, and it was the first time that I had seen it in two weeks mm-hmm. uh, since the election, and it... It felt, it felt like I was watching a completely different play. Um... I mean, it's it's dealing with uh, the idea of revolution and what it means to be a revolutionary, um, and the things that we're willing to do to try to get the change that we want. Um, but there were lines in it, in sections of it, that before I would just hear them, and I'd hear them so much, and you just they they start you know things start to kind of lose their impact. Mm-hmm. Especially when you when you when you're the writer and you're like okay yeah it's that part that's coming up but now hearing it it's just evoking for me at least it was evoking everything that we're sort of going through right now and I have to get I have to tip my hat off to the actors to everybody to in the production who who are back up and doing it and diving into a play that's dealing with these issues now as we're mm-hmm. dealing with them in our personal lives because it has not been easy for them so i'm i'm just i feel honored and humbled to 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 have been able to do this with them and that they're getting up there every night or three nights a week yeah um to to get into this and try to exercise it um which feels anyway. which feels like such a uh an impossible task n- now yeah. in november when the changeover doesn't happen. Like we're in this, we're in this like really scary purgatory period of purgatory <laughs> until 
January when the administrations turn over Mm -hmm. and that's like what happens the next day, you know? Yeah. Holy shit, what happens the next day? And we're right now trying to just get through what we're feeling now. Like your actors are putting their heads down and they're doing the work and they're and they're battling through it. But what happens in, in two and a half months? I mean it hasn't even been a week and already yeah. like shit is, is, is popping off. I know. Like it's, it's it's feels like it's ready to it's rumbling. It's like an right. earthquake. And well you knew talked about the sixties. The mo- like the most recent most tumultuous period of our history. Mm-hmm. It was the sixties were unbelievable. I I I've been watching a lot of documentaries and, and reading about nineteen sixty eight because nineteen sixty eight was such an awful, horrible time in our history with all the assassinations and the mm-hmm. war escalating and all these people dying to fight in another country and 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 people here in the United States fighting, continuing to fight for for civil rights, despite the fact that the Civil Rights Act passed like four years earlier, you know, it's uh, I'm I like I I wish to be able to keep that as a um, a piece of history and not yeah. have it become a, a piece of the present. That's what really scares me is like what, how much of this comes back because and this is something that I touch on uh, in in the introduction to this week's episode, I'm talking um, about bullying. Mm. And um, I'm really talking about the uh, bullying that I am ex- I'm, I'm witnessing in the American theater specifically. Mm-hmm. But um, my want to talk about it is actually coming out of this, um, how we wrote, how we have, um, we've taken a bully and put him in the highest office and what the impact of that on, on people's psychology feeling like they have cover now yeah and um bullying not just like in the school in the schoolyard with the kids beating up other kids but just like bullies in general feeling Mm -hmm. like i want what i want and i'm going to take what i want because i can because i'm bigger than you and i'm more aggressive than you and um i have the power now and look my president did it and he became president so fuck you i can do whatever (laughs) i want that's the thing that scares me most, the ripple effect of elevating a bully to the presidency. Because I, I look back at my – like my voting history goes back to 1992. That was my first election voting for president. And I look at who I was voting against every time it was essentially Republicans. But it was George Bush Sr. Mm-hmm. And then it was um, – uh, God, 1996 – the senator from Kansas, now I can't remember, Bob Dole. Yeah. And then it was George W. Bush, George mm-hmm. W. Bush again, and then McCain, and then Romney. None of those men, as much as the uh, the left will uh, demonize them, none of them were bullies. I agree. You know, none of them were actually evil people. This is a whole new this yeah. is fiction. Like we're living in some dystopian fiction, but it's not. Oh my god! <laughs> I re- I sincerely came in today thinking, how do we avoid talking about? Oh really? It? Yeah. That's funny because I was like, how do we talk about? <laughs> how do we talk about? Well, I mean, I felt like it was inevitable because just because I'm here to kind of talk about the play and the play. You know, it's yeah. about this. So I felt like, and also I felt like this is all on our, this was the subtext. Yeah. I mean, that's why, that's part of why I wrote this play is because of the fear of what is, what's coming in the future. So let's do this. Okay. I want to, I want to, I want to step back. I want to rewind. Okay. And then I want to trajectory into the, Unbound. Okay. Um, so you, we kind of let, I mean, we weren't, we're not really following you chronologically, but my curiosity of you is kind of following a, a chronological trajectory. Mm-hmm. So you're in London and you have this um, uh, anti epiphany, kind of, <laughs> right? Um, it's an interesting way of putting it. So, so uh, you get drunk, and uh, I don't mean like what happened day by day for the no. next, but like where, like where did your trajectory take you from that period? And and also kind of parallel to that, or maybe it's related to that. I'm really curious how you 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 became a writer because because oh. you were an actor at the time. Yeah, I don't know if you were writing at all, but I'm curious how that kind of locked in. 
Uh, well, I'd, I'd written a little bit as a kid. <laughs> I actually remember I used to write a comic book, and I, I actually even remember uh, as a kid watching Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and just writing it down word for word, but putting my characters in all the roles of Harrison Ford and what's her name, Kate Capshaw. Yeah. Like, and so I... That's hilarious. I, I, I wrote a lot when I was little, like comic books and things like that. And, um, but I never thought seriously about uh, becoming a writer until... Um, it was actually in London. See, this is interesting. It was in London that I wrote my first play hmm. after all that happened. I wrote my first play and specifically part, motivated by it. Um, well, it was more motivated by the fact that I felt like, as um, a young black actor, there was just not a, there were not a lot of roles for for me or a lot and my uh, my other fellow black colleagues. Um, I felt like I felt like I wanted to do something that was sort of speaking to the issues that we were sort of feeling. And dealing with in our in our um, in our lives, and so I wrote I wrote this play called Primetime, and it was it's about it's, it was a comedy, and it was about it wasn't it didn't really deal with racism. It was really just about four eight actually eight friends who who were black living in New York, and their the premise was is that the NBA Finals Game Seven New York Knicks. It's been years since they've been to the finals, and now they're about to to be in the finals. Mm-hmm. And they they plan this big party. It's going to be a huge blowout. And they get home, and they realize the television set is gone. No, oh. and they don't know where it is. And this is before DVR. This is before yeah, yeah. social media, all that stuff. Where you just had, I think DVDs were just starting to uh-huh. take off, and people were just get, starting to get cell phones yeah. too. And so the whole play is like this sort of comedy of errors of trying to figure out what happened to the television and and all these other issues sort of come up in their sort of search for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so yeah, so that was that's how I kind of got into writing. And then when I graduated from school, I started transitioning more, or I started acting less and writing more. And uh, my big or my 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 break was uh, getting into. Uh, Getting to meet John Tartaglia, who at the time was on Broadway in Avenue Q, mm-hmm. he uh, he was one of the leads, and he just got nominated for a Tony. And Disney had approached him, and they were like wanted to develop a show around him. And my agent represented him, so she put me in touch with him, and we developed this together. He and I, and and three other people, um, Michael Shupak, Louise Gikau, and um, Jill Gluckson. Uh, we created Johnny and the Sprites, and it ran for like two seasons, and uh, it was it was great. I was my first it was my first TV uh, gig, and I got to watch. It was it was it was filming at Astoria Kaufman Studios, and mm-hmm. I lived in Astoria, so I walk. I got to walk. I didn't mm-hmm. have to take the train. I just walked to work. It was like a 10, 15 minute walk, and um, were you trying? Were you in your head fully? transitioned into being a writer or were you still like how do I carve out acting no I yeah I'd pretty much I'd pretty much left acting behind uh, I was I was I was mainly focusing on writing uh, but then I ended up having another sort of crisis epiphany slash anti epiphany mm-hmm. um, quarter life crisis and I ended up leaving New York and I just started traveling all, I got totally disenchanted with with the entertainment industry with with um, television with television with capitalism I I, I kind of went had this sort of poli- quote unquote political awakening and I started reading a lot of politically leftist stuff I started reading Howard Zinn Chomsky uh, Ch- not not Ch- I, like some articles but like yeah. I didn't, I couldn't I didn't dive into full-on books I read the um a biography of Che Guevara. Yeah. Uh, or I People's History. I read the, the, yeah. the biography of Che, che Yeah, I, that big, thick, red book. I read it, yeah. too. It's re- kind of incredible. It is. And uh, and just started feeling more aligned with that sort of... And that that is actually... Became, that's where I sort of planted the seeds of, of Unbound. That's where Unbound started to really kind of... It came up from that. 
Um, so I le- So after the, the the second season of the show ended and it wasn't it wasn't coming back, I I left New York and I went traveling. I went to. Um, I feel like I, ha- I feel like I need to preface what I'm about to say what I'm about to say with something else that I've purposefully skipped. Uh, but I had gotten I had gotten sick um, at some point. I think it was 2005, 2006, 2006. <laughs> and okay, I'm about to say this. I woke so I woke up one morning. It was like on my 25th birthday. I woke up one morning and I had this horrible like pain in my groin. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And like I decided to just let it go for like a couple days and it was still there and like finally like I went in the bathroom and I looked and my left nut was totally like swollen it was like it was it was in really bad shape and I totally like freaked out yeah and so I called I called my dad and he was like I was like what the hell's going on like and he was like I think it's just an an infection it's called uh I think it's called epididymitis or something like don't don't worry about it I was like, is it cancer? And he's like, no, 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 that's not how that works. You know, just, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm get some antibiotics. It'll knock it out. And I didn't know how I even got it. And uh, he said, sometimes it just happens. And so that really messed me up. It really messed me up because I didn't know how it happened. And it was so, it was so painful. But did you go to a doctor? I did. I went to, I, I went through, I kind of started developing OCD and I went through this really like painful period where like I was so anxious about get it coming back. So I was seeing doctors. I was getting get, getting MRI like MRIs. That's when they scan you. Yeah. And I I didn't. I was afraid something else was wrong. I was feeling like tingling, like all. So over you my, treated it. With I antibiotics treated it, and it went away. It went away. But it but impacted it, you psychologically. It left a it left a, a, a psychological scar. Okay. And I just was having having these horrible anxious thoughts like all the time and uh finally i started that's i started praying again Hmm. i was like god i don't i know we haven't talked in a while but i could really use your help right now and i need something i can't can't be like it was before Mm -hmm. but i need i need i need something and i'm willing to get it's like it's like a breakup you know like Mm -hmm. i don't I'm willing to give it another shot if if you, if are. you are. Just not yeah. even knowing if there's anyone even out there. Yeah. And I I, I, I swear I I heard a, a little voice in my in my head in my heart wherever it said, "We'll just take it one step at a time." And I I got the sense that I need to start moving my body more. So I I I started doing yoga and trying to exercise more. I started studying meditation, and. Once I started studying meditation and yoga and and doing them regularly, I had I had this uh, I don't know what else to call it, but like a, a sort of mystical experience mm. where I felt myself leave my my body, mm-hmm. my sort of sense of self, and I it it seemed like for a second like the veil sort of parted, and I got to see sort of what was behind it and the first thing I felt initially behind it was just light Mm. and then and then it ended and then I kept having more experiences except I'd I'd, I'd wake up from sleeping and I'd get up and then I'd look down and I'd be looking at my body and I wasn't sure if I was dreaming or if I was sleeping Mm -hmm. and I would start walking through my apartment but feeling this sort of sense of dislocation, like it wasn't my physical, it wasn't my physical body. I don't know what it was, and so I was having these experiences, and that was that was really impacting sort of my psyche. And this is all while I was still working on this show. So I'd have these like crazy experiences at night, and then I'd mm. go to show, go to go to the show, and I'd be trying to work and just sort of keep it sort of all together. But I was, I started doing research on psychedelics, and and ayahuasca mm-hmm. and mushrooms like i wanted to get back in there whatever that space was mm-hmm. i wanted back so that's why i started traveling I, that's why i left the show was the, the whole point of that story i left the show i went to peru i was in the amazon for a week i drank ayahuasca 
over the course of three days. Did it give you what you hoped for? Yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, it sh- definitely showed me that there, that there are, there are more things out there than, than I, I than I know about. Mm-hmm. But I didn't come to any sort of definitive, you know, conclusive mm-hmm. answers to my questions. And I, so I kept searching. I stayed in Peru for a little bit longer, and then I went to uh, this sort of Western mystery school in Guatemala and studied lucid dreaming and yoga and the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah. And then I, I got sort of a little bit further into what this could all be about, but I still didn't get what I was looking for. So then I went to Israel. I went mm-hmm. to the Wailing Wall. I went to the Church of the uh, Holy Sepulchre where Jesus is supposed to be buried. Mm-hmm. I was just, I just wanted, I was like, I want an answer, damn it. Yeah. Give me an answer. Yeah. And then I, I didn't get one and I was, I felt so lost and angry and I didn't know how to reintegrate myself back into society after having all these sort of crazy, rich, deep experiences. And so then I got it into my head to, I was like, I don't know what else, what to do, but there's one thing I can do is I can I can start walking. I'm gonna walk across the country in the name of, of world peace. Right. And this came from Peace Pilgrim, who was a woman who walked back and forth across the US for forty years, forty, fifty years, something like that. And she in reading her writings, I saw she had gotten it. Mm-hmm. She had hit she had been, hidden it, she'd been on the mountaintop. And she was like, I get it now. It's it's love. That's what this is all about. That's why I'm I'm here. This is my message. I'm gonna walk across the country back and forth, and that's gonna be my message. Peace. Right. We need to be peaceful to one another. We need to disarm. Cause this was she was doing this during the the arms race. That yeah. was like the big threat of the time. And I was so inspired that she she was doing this without any funding, without any equipment. Like if she just had the clothes on her back, a toothbrush a comb and a pamphlet mm-hmm. with all of her, her, her writings in it. And I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be like her. I'm going to do that. So I did it. I sent an email out to all of my friends. I was like, I'm going to become like Peace Pilgrim. I'm going to walk back and forth across the U.S. Mm-hmm. to promote world peace. I was out there for three days, and then I, I, just, I just dovetailed. I was done. Where did you start? I started in, where did I start? I started in Delaware. Uh-huh. I think, was I in Delaware? I, I, yeah, I think I, yeah, I started in Delaware. I wanted to be at the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. And I wanted to walk to the, you know, to California. Right. I started at the end of August. So right when fall was starting to, yeah. right when it was starting to get cold. And three days later, I was, I was, I was out. I was out for the count. I was like, I can't do this. Was it physically? It was physically demanding. It was psychological. It was emotionally. It was all of it. All the levels that you could imagine. It was just, it was, it was nuts. I was so, I was so unprepared. I was so, I was so, I was so out of it and so desperate for something to hold on to that that, at the time, it seemed like such a good idea, but it, it clearly wasn't. So what do you think it was that she had, this woman that was able to do this for years and years and years that she had, like, what was it that she had that allowed her to be able to maintain this for so long? Well, at the risk of sounding really woo-woo, if I haven't already already done that, I think she p- had purified herself. I think she, she probably would have been the first to say, this is not something that you can just decide to do one day. She said this took, it took her years of walking and and meditating and fasting and working on her own sort of self and examining her her various sort of vices, the things that were preventing her from being open to other human beings. Like she had to go through a lot of what she called peaks and valleys. And then mm-hmm. finally, I think she had just hit a place where the way that she describes it is she said that none of what I do comes from me. It all comes from God. Mm-hmm. God, it's, she's like, it's just like an, it's like a, an energy. It's like plugging into an outlet. It's just energy. And if you're plugged into it, you have, a, you have all that you need. And you weren't plugged into it? I was not plugged into it. I thought that I was. I thought that I had some, mm-hmm. some bit of access to it, but, but I didn't. Not, <laughs> not, I think everybody does. Yeah. But I didn't have, I didn't have what she had. And so, so, uh, 
So it goes three days, and and you, but you had this big dream of what you were going to accomplish. It lasts yeah. three days. How do you pick yourself up and and move on to something else from that? On the third day, that I think on the third night that I was there, I saw a billboard that said, it's okay to make mistakes as long as they're new ones. Mm. And so... After I after I fa- after I failed and was feeling so down. First of all, my friends and my family like really kind of rallied around me and helped me kind of get back on my feet. I can't imagine what they must have been thinking. Mm-hmm. I mean, they some of them have told me, so I don't really have to imagine. But they they really rallied around me and they and they really helped me and have continued to help me because I've I've gone. That wasn't the first time that I've tried something like that. Like there's been times in the not so distant past that I've gotten fed up with everything and just Mm -hmm. tried to leave it all behind Mm -hmm. um and you seem so grounded to me so (laughs) so is this is just this sort of like appearance versus reality kind of Um, thing because you give the you definitely give the appearance of a person who is very grounded and has a very strong sense of self and you know what you want and you're you're doing things, you know? Uh I think that I think I think fa- I think failing so much and hitting hitting rock bottom so much has has kind of helped me to like once you feel your face on the ground, you're like, okay, mm-hmm. this really hurts right now, but this right now feels somewhat stable. Mm. So let me try to stay here for as long as I can and still sort of try to stand up but still be feeling the bottom so that I don't get too far off of it. And mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's what has happened to me. What I've been struggling with throughout the years is getting lost up in the ether, mm-hmm. getting lost in the clouds, you know, and not like there's a, this this quote that I've heard before but I can't source it. Uh, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Mm. You know, you got to keep your feet on the ground, but still, still try to dream and 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 get in the clouds from time to time. Try to get to the mountaintop, mm. but you got to come back. You know what I mean? Mm. I never wanted to come back. I wanted out. I kind of wanted out, but now I I feel like the the valley. There's some good things about the valley. You know. Not necessarily the deepest part of the valley, which kind of feels like where we are mm-hmm. now collectively as a nation, but mm-hmm. but um So you you picked yourself up, your friends and family helped, mm. and uh is this when you started to find your way back to Vegas again? Uh a little bit. Like I worked in I stayed in Vegas for a while. I worked I went back to New York mm-hmm. uh to try to kind of reestablish myself. And then within two weeks, I ended up, I think, joining Occupy Wall Street. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's when that all sort of popped off. And then I was there for two weeks, and then the encampment got raided. And that's when I started to work on Unbound. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the, I worked on the first act. The, there's two acts. And that was, that's when I started to uh, develop the first act and got involved with... Um, Andy Donald, uh, who at the time was the art- artistic director of Naked Angels, mm-hmm. and Laura Savia, who now is a um, associate director. I hope I'm getting the title right. Or associate director over, over at Williamstown, mm-hmm. uh, and they were very instrumental in helping me sort of develop the play, like f- in its very early stages. Um, so yeah, and then. Then from New York, I, I tried L.A. for about a year. I decided to, to, to try to come out here and uh, give it a shot. And then that's where I kind of, at the end of that year, I was like, I can't. I can't do this. I can't be, I can't be a part of the L.A. Yeah. The, the LA, L.A. lifestyle. And so I, I left again and started walking around again. Like I wandered up the coast of California for a while. Um, then... Found myself back in Las Vegas, then left Las Vegas again and went up to San Francisco and then started walking again and then made my way out west where I'd heard about a a man named Daniel Suelo who had given up, who had stopped using money like 15 years ago Mm -hmm. and was living in a cave 
And so I had connected with him. He still had, he goes, he, he walks into, at the time he was walking into town and using the internet. He had a website and he was mm-hmm. blogging about it, about his experiences and like how he was doing it. And so I, I connected with him. I met up with him at the Rainbow Gathering, um, which is, I don't know if you've heard of that. Mm. It's this group of, it's like hippies. It's like hippies. It's just a bunch of hippies. Yeah. Uh, who gather together every year, and uh, I don't. Even, I may have even started in the '60s. I'm not sure, but it's like kind of this. The idea is like it's trying to practice communal living, sharing all those sort of you know ideals, temporary autonomous zone, that whole deal, and uh, what can we accomplish as a community? Uh, it was. It was. It's weird because it. 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 Being there reminded me a lot of being in the Occupy Wall Street encampment, and that there are really good things about it, and there are really horrible things about it mm-hmm. too. Which I think is just a it's just a microcosm of life and our society, really. Um, but uh, so I met with Daniel there, and then we I went back with him to his cave, and we lived I I lived in this cave with him for three months, and we people would come he was he was like a celebrity there in moab mm-hmm. like everybody knew about him and the bbc had done a report on him he had a book written about him there was a documentary mm-hmm. about him and so people were constantly coming and going to like kind of meet him pay homage to him and he i don't i feel like he was more ground he was more grounded than i think anyone i've really had met before cuz he was just so like and he and he wouldn't he didn't present himself. And what I liked about him is that he didn't present himself as a teacher or a mm-hmm. guru or anything like that. He the was person just, with all the all yeah. The he yeah. he he was like I don't have any of the answers. This is what works for me. I wish more people live like this. But he was like I think the most important thing is that you are honest and you're authentic. Mm-hmm. That who you are on the inside is what you let the world see. And if more people did that, then it, we would be getting along with each other a lot better. It's when we hide. It's when we wear masks. And we try to deceive one another and pretend to be people that we're not. That's why we have. That's why we're in the mess that we're mm-hmm. in right now. So, that was sort of his philosophy, and and uh, yeah, that time with him was 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 invaluable. Um, so, are you still? How many years ago was that? That was two thousand. Um, fourteen, I think. So were you that was still, still a couple was, years that ago? That wasn't very long ago. No. Are you still, uh, and perhaps do you think you always will be, kind of like this, where <laughs> where where maybe there like you are a human of the world and and not um, of Las Vegas, of California, of New York. You're just right. a person of the world, and you are going to be where you are for a period of time. And then wander, and then settle and wander. I mean, because it sounds like that's sort of been the pattern, the narrative. Yeah, I'm hoping right now. I'll say this: it seems like every moment I I I, I am in my life, I feel like that this is it. Mm-hmm. That the buck is going to stop here, mm-hmm. and then something happens, and then I'm like, okay, well, this is not where mm-hmm. now I'm moving on, and so it seems like what you just said. It seems like how it's going to be, but I, 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 I feel slash hope that now I can start to settle, settle in a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I really want to be present for my family. Um, I really want to be present for my friends and mm-hmm. to collaborate with them more and create more art with them. And I feel like even now, especially in these times, it's really important for us to to build communities and to build coalitions and to stick together mm-hmm. and and to create spaces where we can we can operate freely and be ourselves and uh and try to <laughs> and try to resist whatever type of negative negative change or negative transformation could be coming our way to try to I think we might have I feel like I might need to stand still for a good while now given i think what's happening and i and i think what i'm what i'm how i'm choosing to look at it is all the things that i've been through up till now have been sort of a precursor maybe to now this moment like mm-hmm. me sort of going out and trying things and failing going through incredible failures but trying to learn from them and and now move into this period where okay now that i've done all these things and tried all these things and had these mistakes and failures and successes 
what can I take from that to now to try to build something? And maybe that means I will travel. I'll still travel. I would like to. I do like traveling, but it would be nice to try to plan it a little bit more and be more strategic in my traveling and operate within a, a larger cycle of, okay, this time of the year I'll be here, this time of the year I'll be here, mm-hmm. as opposed to just bouncing around like a pinball, you know, not knowing where the... Well, traveling implies that there's a place to return back to. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I need a home, a, 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 some place to go back to, you know. What I love is that uh, you aren't, you don't seem to be uh, running from things. You are actively out there seeking things, and that's what's motivating you on these on these journeys. And uh, and uh, I find that so inspiring. I'm, I'm thanks. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. Maybe we come to the end. <laughs> this is the end? I think so. Okay. I don't know. It feels like it, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't... I can't believe I talked about... I can't believe I talked about all that. I had a feeling that just knowing the the, the, the show uh, and that you want to sort of dig in... Yeah. I was like, oh, sh- oh shit. Am What's I going to be talking... Am I going to be talking about all this? Because it is one of those things where, like, I, I, I don't really... I don't offer it. I don't offer this stuff up willingly. Yeah. You know, like recently a lot, like lately, there have been a few times where I've been out with people and I've been with friends who do know me and know I've done all this stuff. Yeah. And they've egged me on and pushed me to talk about. Yeah. And I'm like, they don't want to hear about all this shit. Yeah. We're come on. We're having a good time. We don't well, need to talk about it. Now you don't need to talk about it. You can just send them a link to this. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And uh, and actually, part of I know I I said I would uh, I give you a ride after mm-hmm. after we were done here, mm-hmm. but it really feels like you should probably walk. <laughs> You're a walker. I'm gonna I make just you, walk back to West Hollywood. Make you walk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. No doubt, man. Thanks, thanks for having me. This has been the pleasure. Totally unexpected how this was going to unfold, but I guess it was supposed to happen the way it it did. Right on. All right. Cool. Cool. Thanks to DG Watson for the great talk. His play Unbound, produced by I Am a Theater Company at the Hudson Backstage Theater in Los Angeles, is running now. If now is the time it's actually running when you're listening to this podcast, go to. I am a theater.com that is I A M A theater spelled with an R E dot com for more info. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our podcast through iTunes so these new episodes can be automatically zapped into your devices in the future. And thank you, Time. Thank you to Danny Oliver at LA Stage Alliance and the editor of At This Stage magazine for producing this show. Thank you to David at JTB Recording Studio in Los Angeles for recording this. Thank you to International Pen Pal for the theme song. Thank you for listening. Again, find us on Twitter at Subtext Podcast. And if you want to contact us for any reason, the email is the Subtext Podcast at gmail.com. Now, here we are again at the end, which almost feels like a new beginning, but actually feels like the end. Next month, I will continue to talk as little as I can about the election. <laughs>